at the same time, there were technological advances which were occurring in America, for example, and in Germany particularly, in electric traction. With electrification, the underground was able to expand. However, the extremely disruptive cut and cover method no longer seemed an option for building the railways. London couldn't cope with the chaos to its roads, and so a new type of underground construction was needed. This was going to take the builders deep into the London clay. This is a standard London underground running tunnel, manufactured out of cast iron lining rings. And this slightly larger section of tunnel that we're standing in is called a shield chamber. This is where the Great Head Shield, the device used to help build London's underground railways, was constructed and then dismantled. A South African engineer called James Henry Greathead invented a thing called a tunnelling shield. It was a kind of iron cylinder with a wall in which miners could actually work in safety in all the soft ground. The earth would be dug out in front of the tunnelling shield and when a hole large enough had been constructed, the device could be pushed forward. The tunnel lining could then be erected behind the shield to hold the ground up and then the process repeated. The Great Head Tunnelling Shield allowed the London Underground to expand into a deep level railway network. The shield was the single most important engineering invention used to create the underground. London at the end of the 19th century was filled with exciting transport innovations. Permission had been granted to numerous railroad companies who were proposing deep level underground routes, but the City and South London Railway was the first to make history. In 1890, it became the first electric underground railroad in the world. The decision to actually use electric traction was a really ambitious thing to do at the time because most electric traction systems that were in use were tramways. Getting the electrical equipment small enough to actually run in a tunnel and powerful enough to move these quite large trains was a big challenge. The only way they could do it was to put all the electrical equipment into a small locomotive. The power station for the line was down at Stockwell. The problems they had were that the distribution of electricity from the power station up and down the line was not very good. So as the locomotives got further and further away from the power station and started to approach the station in the city up at King William Street, they often found that they were completely underpowered. And as the trains struggled to go up and down the hills, occasionally they would grind to a halt completely and all the lights would go out, leaving the passengers stranded in darkness. The trains had technical problems, and their carriages offered little passenger comfort. They were dubbed the Sardine Box Railway, or Padded Cell, because of their claustrophobic design. But the City and South London Railway proved that electricity was the only way forward for the underground. Another electric-powered tube company began operating in 1900. The Central London Railway was opened by Queen Victoria's son, the Prince of Wales, the line was built entirely in tunnels, 10 feet in diameter, and since it ran across central London from east to west, there was never much fear that it would fail from lack of passengers. Today, the line is simply known as the Central Line and serves stations along its route, including Oxford Circus, Bond Street and Holborn. The Central London Railway was immediately popular with the travelling public. Over 14 million passengers were carried by the end of the first year. The system was popular because it adopted an American idea of a flat rate fare. It also looked across the Atlantic for its new technology. The original central London electric locomotives were, well they were called camelbacks because they had a cab in the middle and two sloping bonnets on either side, which were built in America by the General Electric Company. They were shipped to England in boxes and assembled in London. One of them was dropped off a barge into the River Thames and had to be fished out before they could build it. The passenger cars were over 45 feet long and weighed 14 tonnes. Gatemen controlled iron grilled gates at each end of the cars allowing passengers to board. The railway used direct current for its traction power. This electricity was picked up by the locomotive from a third rail positioned in the middle of the two running rails. When you want to start an electric motor driving a train, if you start it with all the power all at once, it'll either go into a skid or the motor will blow up because it's had too much power when it's standing still. So you have to apply the power gradually, rather the same way as you change up in your gears in the car. 
And the way they do it is they put a grid of resistors in the circuit with the motor and the resistance reduces the amount of current getting into the motor circuit. And as you want to accelerate, you gradually step out the resistances one by one, you cut them out. And if you listen, you can hear that happening, click, 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 as the train accelerates out of the station. In 1900, London's population was fast approaching 7 million, and there was a heavy reliance on the tube to move these millions quickly and efficiently. But there was a problem with the locomotives. The time taken to uncouple the locomotive when you got to the end of the line and find another one to put on the other end of the train to return to go back was taking up a lot of time and reducing the service. So they introduced what was called multiple unit control. They achieved this by putting two of the motors at one end of the train and two at the other, underneath the passenger cars. The resistors and electrical equipment were put into a space above the motors. All the driver had to do when he wanted to change ends was to shut down the cab at one end, walk down the train, get in the cab at the other end, and he was ready to go. Over the next few years, there was really a railway mania with many, many uh, companies and organisations promoting railways, very few of which ever saw the light of day. But three did, forming part of today's Northern Line, Bakerloo Line and Piccadilly Line. And all three had been given sanction by the government to go ahead, but all three were running into financial trouble. And that's when uh, the American financier, Charles Tyson Yerkes, uh, came to the rescue. Charles Tyson Yerkes arrived in London with his wife and several of his mistresses, leaving behind in the US a shady reputation. Questionable business practices in America led to a prison sentence for his misappropriation of government funds. Charles Tyson Yerkes is a fascinating character. To many people, he's the embodiment of the crooked Victorian businessman. But I think it's important to remember that, of course, he merely operated in the business climate of the day. He wasn't responsible for the first underground railway, um, but what he brought was basically access to several important things. He brought access to American money, to develop the very expensive tube railways being built in London at the turn of the century, and he brought access to American technology, particularly in the electrical field. By 1902, Yerkes had become the chairman of the newly formed Underground Electric Railways Company of London Limited, with a capital of $4 million. Yerkes set about buying up the new electric underground lines. He also built a large power plant at Lotts Road, Chelsea which was an ideal location for being supplied with coal along the River Thames. He believed that if you supplied your own power, you increased your profits. The Lotts Road power plant, which is still clearly visible on the London skyline, was built to specifications to that of American powerhouses. It was one of the biggest generating stations in the world. It contained eight turbo generators running at 1,000 revs per minute, developing 65,000 horsepower. The opening of Yerkes' first tube lines in 1906 and the increasing electrification of his subsurface railways increasingly spelt the death knell of steam locomotives in use on the central area of London Underground. Progressively they were forced to the suburbs and eventually the entire network was electrically operated. When the Underground was first electrified it was decided to use a four rail system which is almost unique in the world. The positive one is on the outside of the rails, and then there's the one in the centre, which is the negative rail. That system was chosen with an insulated return because even in those early days of electrification, it was realised that if the return went through the running rails and through earth, 